<clears throat> I believe Elijah wanted to preach. That's, that's the whole time he was doing that, I was like, he sees daddy up here preaching and mama up here singing and he thinks he's supposed to be talking. Uh, and then he wasn't too sure about Bernard's hand, so he's taking it off. Wouldn't you know it, he'd act up a little bit. It's been a fun morning with him. We'll save the details. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It is one of the most important days in the history of the world. Yet, it's not celebrated or remembered like it should be. So today, as I said in my prayer, I want to tie two passages together that I think will hopefully help us to see the full biblical narrative from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And I hope we'd see, hope we're going to see God at work throughout humanity and his desire to bring us into a closer relationship with him. But first, before we get into that, let's talk about what Pentecost is. Let's just, let's just nail down what Pentecost is. So Pentecost Sunday is the day in the church year in which we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit on the followers of Jesus. You can find the passage talking about this day in Acts chapter 2. And what I want to start off by reading today is verses 1 through 4. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, I forgot it's up there. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that came and rested on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. There's a lot we can get into today there, and that's not the purpose of today's message. We're not going to break down those verses. We will come back to verse 4 here in a little bit. But what I want to do is kind of connect the whole biblical picture together. Now what happened on this day was the, the Holy Spirit, which is a person. We don't refer to the Holy Spirit as it. It's not an impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. So we've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. The Holy Spirit was promised by Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. He's talking to his disciples. He's preparing to go to heaven. And he says on one, it says on one occasion he was eating with them and he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, we just did water baptisms last week, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He was telling them, wait, just as John would dip people down in the water, here soon in a few days they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that means the Holy Spirit would cover them. The Holy Spirit, Paul says, would indwell within them. This was the day in which God would make us not a, not a building, not a church, not a temple. He'd make us his dwelling. Make us the church, us as individuals, as the place where he would live. And so now, even up to today, the Holy Spirit now lives in followers of God. Which means as he lives in us, he works in us. He changes us from the inside out. And he works through us to do the work of God in the world today. We needed the Holy Spirit in order to fulfill the, the mission that Jesus gave his disciples, which was go and make disciples. We can't do that ourselves. We needed God's leading. We needed God's guidance. We needed God's Spirit. My next thing for you is this. The, the coming of the Holy Spirit was a major step in God's plan of bringing humans back into a right relationship with him. And this is kind of my thesis statement, if you want to call it that. That's kind of where we're focusing on today. The purpose of today's message is to see where Pentecost fits in the, in the whole narrative of the history of the world. So the last part of that statement says that we were coming back into a right relationship with him. So now we've got to talk about why are we not in a right relationship with him in the first place. And that goes back to Genesis chapter 1. That goes back to the Garden of Eden. That goes back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, when Adam and Eve, they were put in this Garden of Eden. It's a perfect place, and God dwelled there with his people. He'd walk around with them. He was there with them. And he told them, he says, hey, you can eat from any tree in the garden except for this one. Now, of course, they went against God, and they ate from the tree. They were led astray by the serpent. 
the Satan or Satan, our adversary. They rebelled against God, and ultimately as a result of that rebellion, they could no longer be in God's presence, and so they were cast out into the world. And so over the next few chapters, and we don't have time to look at all of this today, but over the next few chapters, we see humanity begin to spread over the earth, not, not very far just because there was not a lot of time, but we see humanity beginning to live outside of the Garden of Eden. They're having to work the ground. They're having to live with the effects of sin. And at some point, there's these, these beings called the Nephilim that appear on the earth. And once, one day I might do a sermon on the Nephilim, and we might even do a uh, Bible study on them in one of our table gatherings. But basically what happened was that some spiritual beings that God created came down to earth and had sexual relations with human women. And they had sons that were giants among men. And they were called the Nephilim. This is part of the reason why God decided to destroy the earth through the flood. We're told in Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 8 that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Humanity became so evil, so corrupt, and I think the Nephilim play a role in this. The spiritual beings that God created that came down and had relations with human women. Humanity became so corrupt that God says, hey, I've just got to destroy it. Destroy every bit of it. Yet, he didn't give up on us completely because of that verse right there. Genesis 6, 8. He found favor in Noah. He found this man named Noah who was still righteous, who was still trying to live for the glory of God. And so what God chose to do is he chose to continue to build the human race through Noah. He could have gave up on us. He doesn't need us. He does not need human beings. He does not need humanity. He doesn't need me and you. But he chose to create this plan To keep humanity alive, first of all, through the flood, but also to bring humanity back into a right relationship with him. But then, after the flood, we get to Genesis chapter 11. And in Genesis chapter 11, we read about the Tower of Babel. Has anyone ever heard of the Tower of Babel? I'm not sure I've ever preached on it from the pulpit. I'm going to read Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. It says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. So everybody spoke the same language. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let's build ourselves a city. A tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So humanity's working together at this point. And they've, they've kind of been spreading out more over the land. Not too much, though. They're kind of staying together, because it says right there that they didn't want to be scattered. They were kind of staying together. And so what they began doing is they began building this towers what scriptures call it that reaches to the heavens so this would have been a tall tower we believe the thing that they were building was called a ziggurat and that's not a type of animal it's not a rat ziggurat is like a it almost looks like a temple or a pyramid or something to that effect but they were building it as high as they could go because they were trying to get to the heavens here's an actual picture of one that they believe is still it was one that you can still see today you can see it was a tower yes but it also was more like a mountain 
as well. So they were building this man-made mountain to try to stretch to the heavens. Now, scriptures tell us a few reasons on why they were building this, but we can also assume some other reasons. So first of all, these type of structures were part of the worship to false gods in that area. So they were probably feeling like they were worshiping this false god by building this. But also, if you think about these people, they're a few generations removed from the flood. Don't you think that they're afraid that they probably forgot the promise of God that he would never uh, flood the earth again? But don't you think they're probably afraid that it could happen again? So we're like, let's build this mountain, let's build this tower and get it to go as far in the heavens as possible. And I think it's partly to save them from maybe another possible flood. Anytime we try to save ourselves, we're in trouble. Ultimately, though, this tower was an act of rebellion against God. They are going back to, uh, well, we're going to go Genesis 9, 1 and then back. But God had given them the instruction to scatter over the whole earth. He gave them that instruction in Genesis 9, 1. God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Yet, look at one reason why they're building this tower in Genesis 11, 4. They're building this tower so that otherwise they don't want to be scattered over the whole earth. They're building this tower to make a name for themselves. They want to be recognized. They want to be in power. And they don't want to be scattered. And so they're saying, yes, we know the command you gave us, God, to be fruitful and increase the number and fill the earth. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to scatter. We want to stay together. We want to continue to be one, one group, one language, together, working together, because nothing's going to be impossible for us. We don't need you, God. That's essentially their attitude. We don't want to follow you, God. And so the Lord came down in verses 5 through 9. It says, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. Who's, who's God talking to when he says, let us come down? Let us go down and confuse their language. I have theories on that. I'll share them some other time. So the Lord scattered them over, from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So God comes down, he sees this act of rebellion, he sees that they're trying to make a name for themselves. He sees that they are actively going against what he had commanded them to do. And so what he does is he confuses their language. That's how we get the different languages today. And that's often where we stop. It's just like, we're like, okay, they just included this so that we know how we have different languages today. But there's other key parts in here where we're told that the Lord scattered them. So the Lord moved them around the earth. He separated them from one another. But something else really sad happened that day. The people who were rebelling against God ultimately alienated themselves from God. And God gave them over to their wishes. We find that truth in Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 through 9. It says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, when did he divide all mankind? At Babel. That's when the division happened. He set up boundaries for the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. Let's get the um, pen out. So we're told that he divided all mankind. That happened at Babel. He set up boundaries. So they've been scattered over the, the entire earth. They've been scattered over the region. But then in verse 9, what we are told is that the Lord has a portion. So he has a group of people 
that he shows favoritism towards. He has a group of people that he has kept for himself. They are his allotted inheritance. So he has chosen to work through a certain group of people. And we know who that group of people is. It's the nation of Israel. It's God's people as found in the Old Testament. But if he is showing favoritism towards one group, then guess what? That means the other groups are not being favored as much. Ultimately what happened that day and this is the sad truth of it, is that God disinherited the other nations and the other people. Why? Because they were living in rebellion to him. They didn't want God. And so God says, I'm giving you over to your rebellious hearts. And so the lesson from Babel that we need to know today is that those who live in rebellion are given over to their rebellious hearts. We see this in the Old Testament. We see how humanity had just kept rebelling against God. So he said, basically, okay, you be your own nations with your own gods. You do what you want to do. If you think you can handle it, then handle it. And he says, I'm going to work through my people, a specific group that I'm going to call Israel. They're going to be the people of God. I'm going to give them this land. I'm going to give them the promised land. I'm going to work through them, ultimately, though for the good of all why did he do this why did he choose this a certain group why didn't he choose to work through all of humanity i think it's because he doesn't want to treat us like robots we've been given something so number one we're created in the image of god and god has free will he can do what he wants when he wants because we are created in the image of God, we also have this free will, this ability to do what we want to do. Now, God could, because he's powerful, he could treat us like robots. He could make us do anything and could totally take away our will, our ability. But he has chosen, and I think this is an act of love, to not treat us like little puppets on a string. I think he has allowed us to make the freedom of choices. But he's also not going to be afraid to, to tell us what choices we should be making for the good because of how he created us. And he does still try to get our attention. But I think over time, if we keep rebelling against him as the nations were doing, as people still do today, eventually he's going to stop trying as hard to get our attention. And we find that truth in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 25 and verse 28, it says this. God gave them, so before all this, this is to give you some context, before all this, Paul talks about how God tried, and get, tried to get people's attention. He tried building a relationship with them, but basically they choose to continue to rebel. And it says, so God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator, which is forever praised. Amen. In verse 28, it says, furthermore, just as they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over. Basically, it meant God stopped trying to get their attention. He gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. He basically said, if you're going to continue to rebel against me, if you're going to continue to live in sin, if you're going to continue to turn your back to me, I'm going to stop yelling at you trying to get your attention. And then Paul proceeds to list all these things that he gave these people up to doing. He wasn't going to force them to follow him. Instead, he was going to allow them to do what they wanted. And the same thing is happening today, which is why you see this world becoming darker and darker. On one hand, he loves us so much that he's not going to treat us like pu puppets. He created us to be like him. He created us to make our own decisions. But he desires what is good for us, so he's going to tell us what is right and wrong. But it's up to us to decide our own free will to follow him. 
Basically, he's always going to make a way for you to turn back to him. But eventually, if you keep rebelling, he's going to give you over to your depraved mind. Now, God does pursue us, and he tries to get us to correct path. We know the scriptures. He leaves the 99 to find the one. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He will do what he can to get our attention. But he isn't going to constantly pursue us if we keep rejecting him. That's a hard truth about God. It's a tough truth about God. But it also means we need to take our sin seriously. That if we are living in rebellion, we need to repent as soon as possible. Because eventually, that Romans verse, God could give you over to your evil desires. God could give you over to your depraved mind if you don't turn. So this means that God will stop convicting us. I was talking to someone the other day, and he's, he's talking about how he's struggling in life right now. And um, I said, well, i tell you what I think. I think, the, I think the enemy's attacking you. I think he's trying to stop you from following God. And he says, well, I don't, I don't think it's following God when I, I'm, I'm saying GD. And I, I said, do you feel bad about that? And he said, absolutely, it wrecks me. I said, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you. I said, that means God has not given up on you yet. Eventually, that conviction will die off if you keep turning against God. Eventually, he won't convict you anymore. Will you still know what's right or wrong? Yeah, to some degree. I think even non-Christians know we shouldn't murder. We shouldn't do some of these things. We have a conscience. But ultimately, that strong conviction that we receive when we do wrong that will go away when God stops trying to get our attention. But as long as we're feeling that, that conviction, that means God, he's not given us over yet. And so we need to repent. Even if we don't feel that conviction, the good thing about God is he always makes a way for you to come back to him so you still can repent. But if we are living in rebe- rebellion, we have to repent. And we have to enter into a loving relationship with him where we love him with all of who we are, where we don't turn our back to him, where we don't live in rebellion, where we actually live following God. This is where we get to the heart of God, though, the character of God. Throughout all of humanity, I know that's a a yucky truth to think that God will give you over to your sinful desires and depraved mind. But the good thing about God is God has always given us a way for us to make the choice to get into a right relationship with him. Even if he does give us over to our desires, he doesn't cut us off completely. He always makes a way for us to come back into a loving relationship with him. In other words, he never completely gives up on us. But it's up to me, it's up to you, it's up to us to make the choice to turn back. We see this through the Old Testament narrative After he disinherited the nations at Babel, he did choose to work through his people Israel. And that started with Abraham. He was the beginning of Israel. Through Abraham and these people that would come from Abraham's descendants, God would work through, and according to Genesis 22, 17, 18, that God would work through these people and reach the very nations that he had handed over they would end up being blessed. That's what it says here in Genesis twenty-two, seventeen 17 through 18. I will surely bless you, talking to Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sands on the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So just... Not long before this, he had given these nations over to their rebellious hearts, but now he's saying, hey, I'm going to work through these people. This is my allotted inheritance. I'm going to work through them. And guess what? Those same nations that I had handed over, they are going to be blessed through these people, through my people. And one day he would act again to bring them out of the darkness that their actions had pushed them into. He re-upped this covenant with Moses. Here's what he tells Moses. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Shows favoritism towards a certain people. Although the whole earth is mine, 
you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. I, get, I put this in bold for a reason. Because going back to the covenant he made with Abraham for Israel, he says all the nations of the world will be blessed. When he talks to Moses, he, he tells Moses how this is going to happen. The very people that he's working through are going to be a kingdom of priests. He is going to use them to minister to those people who are living in rebellion against him. And this is where Pentecost comes in. Jesus, he came and he preached the gospel to God's people, Israel. We know he died for the sins of the world so that everyone would have the opportunity to get back into a right relationship with God. And then he rose from the grave. He promised to send the Holy Spirit. And he sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Pentecost and the events at the Tower of Babel are connected in ways that I'm not sure that we have really focused on. So let me talk to you now about the reversal of Babel at Pentecost, and then we'll close it down. At Babel, the people were trying to reach up to the heavens. You know, they were trying to build up. But at Pentecost, heaven, in the form of the Holy Spirit, came down to us. So they were trying to go up. They were trying to reach God. But at Pentecost, God says, I'm coming down to you. I'm coming down to my people who are not living in rebellion, my people who love me, my people who, who know me, I'm coming down to them and I'm going to live in them because I desire a relationship with you. I desire a relationship with my people and ultimately God desires a relationship with all the world. It's the opposite of what happened at Babel. The second thing that was the opposite is at Babel the nations were scattered, but at Pentecost the nations were gathered. Let me explain why. Acts 2, 5, we're told that they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Spoiler alert, there was no one there from America. America was not in existence at that time. So when it says every nation under heaven, it was all the known world at that point. They had Jews from every nation under heaven in Jerusalem. Why? Well, it's because Pentecost is actually a Jewish festival. Pent, who can tell me what pent means? Five, and it, it's really 50. It refers to the, the, the 50th day. So it comes 50 days after the resurrection or after Passover. So it was what's called a harvest celebration. It was when crowds from all over the world, Jews from all over the world, would travel to Jerusalem as part of this festival. And this festival was basically about praising God for his blessings and his provision for them. That he had provided them with a harvest. That he had provided them with things in the last year. You can read about the festival of Pentecost in the Old Testament. This is not something they came up just for Pentecost Sunday. This was something that Jews did every year. But isn't it interesting that the day in which they are to go to Jerusalem and to thank God for all of his provisions for them, that God would provide them with the Holy Spirit. I think there's a lesson in that, that when we're grateful for what we have, God will give us more. And so Jews from all over the world are there. And he provides his spirit on this day in particular, I think, for one main reason. And I think it's to reach the people, the nations from all over the world. But because their language was scattered at Babel, how was he going to reach every nation at that time? Something else had to happen in order for them to understand the gospel. And so that's where we go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That does, that's the, the reference to tongues there is not a reference to the prayer languages that you might hear at a, at a Pentecostal church. Um, the reference to tongues there is literally languages. The Holy Spirit enabled these believers to speak in other languages 
Why would he want them to speak in other languages? Because there were people from all over the world there. And so at Babel, they couldn't understand one another. But at Pentecost, they all could understand the gospel being taught. It's reversal. He scattered them there at Babel. He, he wanted to make sure that they couldn't understand. But then God is moving through his people, through his believers, through Israel at that time. He's moving through them so that those that had been scattered, those that couldn't understand each other at Babel, could understand the good news of the gospel. And that they did. In Acts 2, 6-8, it says, When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Basically means these are a bunch of, of dummies. These are a bunch of people that should not only be speaking one language. They were not known as the smartest people in Galilee. But yet, they are speaking in different languages. They wouldn't have had education to do that. There is no way they could speak in other languages other than through the move of God. And so they ask themselves this question, then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language i love connecting babel and pentecost together because you see that god was yes he he allowed them to continue in their rebellion at babel he said okay if you guys are going to work together and if you're going to continue to live in rebellion together then i'm going to scatter the nation so that you'll stop working together and you're i'm going to be giving you over to your rebellious hearts but at pentecost he says i'm not giving up on you yet I'm still here to try to reach you. I'm still here to, to, because I desire a relationship with you. And so that day, in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches a sermon. And 3,000 people respond to the gospel that day and become followers of Jesus. And I'm getting chills thinking about it. And I'm hot, so this is, this is Holy Spirit chills. Um, God knew that if he came that day and he worked through his disciples, he worked through his people, then these people would be reached. And guess what? These people are not staying in Jerusalem forever. Guess where they're going? They're going back home. They're going back to their nations. And guess what they're going to do? They're now followers of Jesus. They're going to preach the gospel to their people. God chose that day in particular to reverse what happened at Babel. Ultimately what happened is, is the 120 in the upper room and all the Jews, which is the nation of Israel, all the Jews that had responded to the message that day, what did they become to the people of the nations that didn't know God? They became a kingdom of priests. goes back to what God promised. They're now, they might not be ordained, they might not have you know, papers or whatever, but Anybody that preaches the gospel is a priest. And we're all called, and we're getting ready to get to this, we're all called to be priests. We're all called to minister. These people are going back. They're preaching the gospel. They're ministering. God is reaching back out to the nations using his chosen people, the very ones he, would, he called a kingdom of priests. Which brings us to the significance of Pentecost for today. God does desire a relationship with everyone. Through the book of Acts, the church spreads the gospel to those nations. And they do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. But what I love about the book of Acts is that, yes, we can read about the works of God. We can read about the ways that God is working or has worked in, in the church. We can read about how he reached people. But we also can live this out in our life. We can live this out in the church today. In other words, the mantle has been left to us. We are to be God's witnesses. But the only way we can be God's witnesses is through the power of the Holy Spirit. I was on a Zoom call with the general superintendent of the Wesleyan Church this past Tuesday. And he's introducing this concept uh, at our conferences this year um, called Acts 1-8. And he says, it's not, it's not original, it's actually Acts 1-8. And he call, he's calling us to have an Acts 1-8 mindset. And it just went so good with my sermon that I have to include basically what he, he was telling us uh, today. 
So let's read Acts 1-8 to understand what we're talking about. It says, you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He first started by talking about, it goes to the first part here, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. He says, nothing we do, and, and I'm telling you this, nothing we do today can be done without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us so that we can be witnesses in, all, in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So let me summarize it with this point and then we'll break it down. Followers of Jesus, including us today, including you, we have been sent into all the world as priests empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's work backwards. We have to have the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. But we also need the Holy Spirit to fight against the forces of darkness. I think God's leading me next week to preach on spiritual warfare. Because I think uh, from what I'm hearing from some people, that's what we're experiencing in our church right now. Some spiritual warfare going on. Guess what? We have no power in ourselves against the forces of darkness in the heavenly realms. But God does. And so we have to rely on the Holy Spirit to fight those battles for us and to empower us and equip us. The Holy Spirit empowers us and equips us by giving us unique gifts and abilities. We call them spiritual gifts. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will do a miracle through us. It's not us. None of us have that power, but God does. And ultimately, he gives us the authority of their spiritual realm through prayer because God's with us. The next part there is priest. We have been sent into the world as priests. And you might be thinking, you could also put pastors there. You could put whatever you want to there. This goes to 1 Peter 2, 9. You are chosen people. He's not talking about Israel anymore. He's talking about you. He's talking about the church. Peter says, you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, the good news of the gospel is that, yes, God chose to work through a certain nation throughout the Old Testament. He reached them with the gospel. Now they're reaching the other nations that God had in, in disinherited. And now anybody, Gentiles, Jews, you can become a follower of Jesus. And if you become a follower of Jesus, you are now a part of that holy nation. You are now part of those chosen people. You are now a part of God's special possession. And ultimately, you are a part of a royal priesthood. Pastors should not be the only one doing ministry. When we all have been equipped with the same Holy Spirit. I... Uh, I was reading a book that said one of the worst things that happened in the church was that we started ordaining pastors and church leaders. And the reason why this guy was saying that, and I, I, you know, I don't know if I completely agree with him, but I get what he's saying, is because we made it look like that there was professionals who were supposed to do ministry and there were non-professionals who were supposed to sit in the seats. But it's wrong. I don't, I don't think the early church viewed it that way. I think there was some hierarchy there, but they understood that they were a royal priesthood. That they were all called into ministry to do the work of God. You are called to do ministry you are called to minister wherever god puts you you are called to minister just as much as i am why do i know that because if you are a follower of god you have the same holy spirit that i do and he can equip you and gift you and work through you the same way he can work through me and that's where we get to the last thing we are called to be sent that verse there i'm gonna go back to acts 1 8 says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I kind of covered this in table gatherings last week when we talked about liberty. And we're going to talk about liberty a little bit now, but just give you some context of what way we apply this. 
So Jerusalem was obviously where the believers were. So when we talk about Jerusalem, we're talking about our immediate area. So for our church, our immediate area is Seagrove. We're called to reach our Jerusalem. Now, Seagrove's a lot smaller than Jerusalem. But we're still called to reach the people in this area. For you, as ministers who have been sent out, your Jerusalem might be your family. Your Jerusalem might be your workplace. Your Jerusalem might be your friends. Those that are closest to you, they are your Jerusalem. But then he instructed them to go in all Judea and Samaria. And I'm going to separate those two. Judea would have been the surrounding area. So for us, we're getting outside of our immediate area here in Seagrove, and we're planting a church in Liberty. So that's 40 minutes away. We're kind of getting outside of, of the area right here at us. So we are fulfilling the Judea call. And we also might be fulfilling that Samaria call because Samaritans were different from the Jews. And so what Jesus was telling them is, you need to reach people that are different from you. That might have a, a little bit different culture than you. You need to reach people who may look different than you. Who may speak different than you. For us today, that means that we are called to reach people that look different than us. That have different skin color. That speak different languages. And I believe that might be exactly what we end up doing at Liberty. I believe there's going to be an African American and Spanish speaking uh, congregants in that area. And we might be called to reach out to them. We're called to reach people who are different than us. But ultimately we're called to go to the ends of the earth. To continue to have a mission focus. To continue to reach out. As a fulfillment of God's uh, grand plan of bringing people back into a relationship with him. You are now a part of that plan. But you have to choose to be an Acts 1-8 person. We as a church, we are becoming an Acts 1-8 church. Have we reached out to our Jerusalem? Yes. Have we had the heart to reach out to our Judea and Samaria? Yes. Now we're met with this opportunity to do exactly that. By planting a church in liberty. And I think God wants to use you. To bring people, both in our Jerusalem and Seagrove and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He wants to use you to bring people into a right relationship with him. The question is, is well, will you let him use you? And I know we can come up with all these excuses in our head. I'm not capable. I have nothing to offer. I'm not special at anything. I'm not good at anything. But guess what? You do have something to offer because if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you have all you need. Because he will empower you to do whatever he has called you to do. And so those of you that um, don't know about our Liberty Project, uh, I can explain it to you later. But ultimately, um, quick summary is our denomination has asked our church to plant a new church in Liberty, North Carolina, about 40 minutes from here, to plant a new church there in partnership with a congregation of a church that's closing there. Today is their last Sunday. You might notice Don and Kathy are not here today. The pastor there, uh, she's pregnant. She's been having contractions this week, and so she did not feel comfortable driving to Liberty. It's about an hour drive for her. And so she asked if Don and Kathy would be willing to go. So Don and Kathy are up there for their last service. Uh, today and that church is closing uh, and we're planning on reopening it September 10th over the next three months we're going to have a lot of work to do in that building to transform it and ultimately I think we're going to have a lot of work to do to build relationships in that area as we become witnesses for God in Liberty in Judea I think God is calling each and every person to be a part of this mission in some way or another. And I shared this with you during our table gatherings, but we're asking people to, number one, be a prayer warrior. The enemy's going to attack. The enemy does not like us having a kingdom mindset, seeking to grow the kingdom outside of our immediate context. So we need people to pray, to fight in the spiritual realm for us. Maybe you're called to be a restorer, which means you help with the remodel. 
which means that you're willing to get in there and get dirty and tear things up and build things, put things together. You're willing to put in some time this summer to get in there and help. But ultimately, we need people to be pioneers who are willing to go to Liberty when we reopen it to be a part of that church part-time. Still come here some, but also go there some. Possibly one week a month, at the maximum two weeks a month. But we need people to go up there and serve, lay the foundation for that church, be witnesses in liberty as we strive to reach that community. And so I've told you that a few weeks ago that we were going to ask you to respond today, and that's exactly what we're going to ask you to do. There in front of you, on your clipboard, you see a little paper. That's, I think it says Liberty Partnership Card. If you would, if you are a part of our church, if you would, please fill out that card on which of the three that you plan on helping with. And as we sing this last song, worship team, you can come on up. As we sing this last song, I'm going to invite you to come lay it down at the altar. As an offering to God to say, God, here I am. And, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to keep these cards and we're going to make a database of people who are willing to be pioneers, who are willing to actually go to Liberty when we reopen it in September, people who are willing to help with remodel, and people who are going to be praying for us. And we're going to, we're going to seek God's will and however he wants to use you to be his witnesses, both here in, in Seagrove, but also in Samaria and beyond. So when you finish right now and you can stand to your feet,